Welcome to Last Set News. So today, uh, what we did is we had a lot of questions that had come out about uh, tax losses and how to not pay so many taxes and the different things that happened with uh, Treasury nominee Janet Yellen. So what I did was I brought in uh, Sheehan Chandra Sakara and he asked or answered a ton of questions that only a registered CPA who specializes in cryptocurrency possibly can. And it went in depth and it went to almost an hour. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna break this up into two pieces. The first part, we're gonna talk about uh, how you can potentially uh, avoid pretty much any taxes by moving to a territory in the United States called Puerto Rico and uh, how that would look like, what it would entail and the things that you have to do. And then we're gonna do like a quick Q&A. And the last thing we're gonna take a look at is uh, Treasury nominee Janet Yellen, where she, there was two things that came up. One, she talked about uh, cryptocurrency and illicit activities, but that wasn't the big thing. The big thing was the second thing that she said, which is where she talked about uh, unrealized tax or, or tax gains that would be uh, actually taxed, uh, which would be a very odd thing. And Sheehan, because he is a professional, he's a CPA, he knows exactly what uh, she is talking about. He said, yeah, unrealized tax, unrealized capital gains tax, it does happen. It happens right now. It's been happening for decades. And I was like, what? So this is uh, important to listen to and to understand. Uh, and this is why I bring in professionals that can really help us decipher what exactly is going on and really get into the meat and potatoes. So this will be the first video of two. So enjoy. I had to bring in a special guest to alleviate some of the fears out there. There's been a lot of different discussions about what is going on with, with taxes and unrealized tax gains and the different FUD articles that are going on, on top of the fact that, uh, of uh, a different story that came about that talks about you can pay zero taxes if you move to Puerto Rico, which to me sounds fantastic. So I brought on in the uh, smartest person I could find uh, that would know all these things. Uh, this is uh, Sheehan Chandra Sakara, and he is a CPA who specializes in cryptocurrencies. So Sheehan, thanks for coming on the show and uh, bring a little bit of a levity to the situation. Yeah, thanks for having me again, Dan. Yeah, sure, exactly. So let's do this. First, let me, let me share my screen and let's start with this. So first of all, let's talk about Sheehan, right? Let's talk about you, Sheehan. Talk about how great you are. So. <laughs> <laughs> first of all, uh, just, just ignore the, uh, the memes that you see on the top right corner. Yeah, um, well, that's yeah. all Twitter, baby. That's all Twitter. That's, that, that's something Twitter, Twitter goes around. Yeah. Uh, so, do, do you want me to kind of give you an introduction or Dan, you're going to do an introduction, it's up to you. No, let, let me do it like this. So I'll, I'll say, I'll, I'll start and tell you. So, so Sheehan here, he is the uh, head of tax strategy at Cointracker, also one of the writers at Forbes Crypto, and uh, tax partner at JAG. And then uh, he's got his own uh, different setup that we will go over in a bit. Also, uh, if you want to really delve into taxes and cryptocurrency, uh, Sheehan and uh, I think his partner here, uh, Shandan Loda, is that you say his name? Yeah. They gave, they gave a talk at Google not too long ago, December 11, 2019. So needless to say, uh, this gentleman here is entrenched into not only taxes, but cryptocurrency digital assets in our market. So, Sheehan, did I cover uh, where you've been, what you're doing, and who you're all about uh, adequately for your professional, or is there anything you want to throw in there? No, I think, I think that's, that's, that's good. Awesome. See? Pretty simple. This guy's <laughs> awesome. All right. So, so Sheehan, let's do this. First thing I want to talk about is this fantastic article that you wrote called the Puerto Rico Crypto Tax Loophole. And for everybody who has been on my channel, every time that I, I talk about a certain article, I, it really has to grab my attention in the first paragraph. And that is done beautifully here by Sheehan when he says this, you can completely avoid US crypto capital gain taxes by moving to Puerto Rico and satisfying certain requirements. And that first sentence right there, I'm like, I'm gonna read this whole thing. I know that for a fact. And then it starts about this crypto tax strategy is well suited for crypto whales, net worth over a million, but comes with several complexities. So I'm like, all right, tell me more. So she and I'm going to have you talk about this short term capital gains versus long term capital gains. And there's this thing called the net investment income tax. What the heck is that? Let us know so we can uh, uh, be a little bit more informed. Yeah, uh, just to kind of give you a quick overview, uh, short-term capital gains occur when you sell your coins uh, after holding it for less than 12 months. 
And uh, long-term capital gains happen when you sell your coins after you hold them for more than 12 months. Um, the TLDR here is that long-term capital gains are, are better because they're subject to more favorable tax rate than short-term capital gains. Now, on the top of those capital gains, there's an additional 3.8% net investment income tax if your adjusted gross income uh, is about a certain threshold. So, Dan, if you go to that link, you can you can kind of figure out if you're subject to that net investment income tax. Um, the threshold depends on your income and also uh, your filing status, whether you're a single uh, filer or a married filing uh, taxpayer. So, what that means is if you're like a very, very high net 30 individuals, uh, you'll, you, if you sell something that you held for more than 12 months, you have a 20% long-term capital gain tax rate plus another 3.8% net investment income tax uh, on, the, on those gains. Right. So, and so right now, what we're talking about right here is only in America. Every other country has their own different capital gains tax. I know Canada, I, I, we have uh, people from Canada as far as subscribers, they're getting slaughtered over there in certain European countries. It's, uh, it's really bad. Uh, but in America, this is what we got. So we're looking at short term. So remember, short term capital gains, anything less than a year. So if I buy Bitcoin today, what is January 22nd, 2021, and I sell it in April 2021, that is short term capital gains all the way up to a year. Now, if I buy Bitcoin today, uh, April or sorry, January 22nd, 2021, and I sell it on January 23rd, 2023, as long-term capital gains, and it all depends on my income. And it's all progressively based, correct? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Just, just remember that cutoff line, which is the 12 months, yeah. Yeah, so everybody out there, if you want to sell stuff, wait for a year. <laughs> that is yeah. the, probably, probably the best thing you can do. And then there's a question that I get all the time about taxes. So, Shian, walk us through this real quick. When do you get taxed on cryptocurrency? To me, it's always four things. Tell me if I'm wrong here. If I have crypto to crypto, so if I have uh, Bitcoin and I change it for Ethereum, that is a potential tax, depending on which way I go. If I, if I sell Bitcoin and I get into a stable coin that is crypto to crypto, I still get taxed. If I go crypto to fiat, meaning I, I take Bitcoin, I sell it for dollars, I get taxed. And then there's the, the uh, two payments. Either uh, I get paid in crypto, which would be pretty awesome, let's be honest. Uh, then they're going to tax that or goods and services. Because I was always under the impression, because I really want a Tesla at some point, which I probably <laughs> never get. But, uh, and I thought to myself, man, if Elon Musk would just allow me to buy that cyber truck in Bitcoin, I wouldn't have to pay any taxes. But it doesn't matter because it's a goods and or a service. So... Those are the ones that I think about. Anything else I left out? I'm sure I did. Uh, no, I mean, just to kind of give you a quick summary, I mean, Dan was, was right, but uh, I think let's just go through from the easiest to, you know, somewhat difficult to comprehend. Yeah. Number one, you know, you're just cashing out your crypto. You know, you, you got a Bitcoin at 10,000 bucks, you're selling it for $30,000 cash, you pay capital gain taxes on 20,000. Number two, you're converting one cryptocurrency to another. Uh, and here's like a lot of taxpayers find it kind of difficult to digest because they're like, okay, I never received any cash. Why do I have to pay any taxes? Uh, the point here is that the, the IRS doesn't care whether you have received cash or not. IRS taxes if you have access to some type of wealth. Um, so when you do a crypto to crypto trade and if you make a profit, you got to pay taxes even though you didn't realize any cash. Um, number three is when you earn crypto. So you could be earning crypto through some type of DeFi platform. You could be uh, staking income, mining income, or you could yeah. be working for like a startup. Then you're getting paid um, you know, through crypto. So those are taxable as ordinary income. And number four, as Dan mentioned, when you spend crypto through like a debit card or credit card to buy goods and services, that's taxable too. Again, in the eyes of... According to the IRS, whenever you spend your crypto, you're pretty much disposing your crypto. Uh, and when you dispose crypto, there's always a difference between how much you paid for that crypto versus the market value at the time you're disposing it. So that difference, if it's a positive difference, that's tax. Um, and then finally, airdrops and forks. Uh, you know, it, it sucks, I know. Uh, and in 2020, there were a couple of very significant uh, airdrops, a uni airdrop. Yes. And, and the spark token yeah um 
yeah, especially among the XRP community, like they they didn't take that well. Like you know, uh, the rule is that at the time you receive the Spark tokens into your wallet, and uh, when you have the ability to move those tokens, that means you have dominion of control. Right. You got to pay taxes. Again, IRS does not care what happens to the price of the Spark tokens after you receive it into your wallet, whether you cash it out or not. You got to pay taxes at the time you receive it, based on the value at the time you receive it. Um, so that's the airdrop side. And, and the four, 2017, uh, the big one, the Bitcoin Cash got divided into Bitcoin. I mean, Bitcoin divided into Bitcoin Cash. Yeah. So again, that was taxable too, uh, as soon as those Bitcoin Cash you know, hit your wallet. So Sheehan, that's scary. That's super scary. And uh, as I've said before on this channel, I, I'm not very sensationalism. I am uh, pretty much like a wet blanket and conservative. That's just how I am. So people are like, oh, Rob, you're so boring. Well, Sheehan here is kind of in the same vein as what we're talking about here. A little bit of a, of a wet blank in Sheehan, I'm sorry to say, but here's what's just scared me. So Uniswap comes to me, I got 400 tokens. It was worth, I think it was uh, $4 or something like that. Yeah, so 400 yeah. for 400, so we're looking at 1600. So regardless of if I actually cash out or not, depending on the way that, you, or however the government wants to do this, it sounds to me like I'm going to owe on $1,600. Does that sound about right? Yeah, that's correct. But uh, specifically in the unique case, uh, there was a gap between uh, the price at the time you claimed it versus at the time you actually received that token uh, because there was a huge amount of network congestion and stuff like that. So in the case of Uniswap, like you got to figure out the price at the time you received those tokens into your wallet, and that's considered order income. Um, you should not recognize order income uh, at the time you claimed it because claiming doesn't mean that you have control over it. Hmm. Oh my gosh, I'm going to own a lot of taxes. So which is important <laughs> why we're going to get into our next piece, which is talking about Puerto Rico and trying to get away, not get away, but legally uh, trying to not pay as many taxes. So let's just jump into that real quick before I start crying. Here's the criteria. You have to be a bona fide resident of Puerto Rico. I read this, I'm like, what does that mean? It means really there's, there's three things. You have to spend more than 183 days in Puerto Rico. So we're looking at, you have to be there six months or so. You need to actually be in Puerto Rico to be considered a resident of Puerto Rico. Now, people will say, well, you know, how will they know? We'll get to that in a bit. But the second part is you must not have a tax home outside of Puerto Rico. So Shan, walk me through this real quick, because I was, I, was, I was questioning this. A tax home outside of Puerto Rico, do you mean like a primary residence, or do you mean like uh, some type of uh, investment property that you use for something else? Yeah, uh, this is a good question. So, uh, so in the tax rule, you know, we call this number one rule. It's a bright line rule, right? Because it's, it's quantitative, we can measure it. So number two and three, those come down to the facts and circumstances of each situation. So in the case of, you know, tax home, like there's no like definition uh, that tells you, okay, here's your tax home. Okay. Uh, but what, like, I'll give you some examples where you would still have U.S. as your tax home, although you want to be a Puerto Rico resident. So this is a situation where like you could have, you know, a couple of rental properties, you know, still in the U.S. You are a member of uh, a local uh, organization. You would still, you, you, you could still have your driver's license in Texas or some other state. You could still have some property in the U.S. So that would kind of establish U.S. as your tax home, although you're in Puerto Rico. So in that case, you're not meeting the bona fide uh, resident test. In, in simple terms, like, you, you cannot play around. I mean, if you're moving to a separate country, like you should not have any type of affiliation with, with any like U.S. or, 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 any, or any state. So uh, that's why they define tax home um, on like a more like a factual, like a facts and circumstances type of um, uh, test without giving like a bright line rule. Because if, if somebody were to say, OK, do these items, then people would do that just to pass the test. Sure. Um, so that's the reason why those are like somewhat gray areas, but there's enough things that you can do to not have U.S. as your tax home. So I, I, I kind of understand. So let's say like I have, a, I have a house here in Houston and then I move over to Puerto Rico. So that 
I, I wouldn't want to say, well, this is my primary residence, obviously in Houston, my primary residence is a home that I purchased or a apartment that I rent over in Puerto Rico, correct? But here's, so let, let's say like this, the primary residence that I used to have, what if I say, you know what, I don't want to sell that, I don't want to get rid of it, I want to use that as a, um, as a rental property, and I want to put it on Airbnb, VRBO, or I want to do some kind of long-term rental for somebody else. Would I still hit the criteria for that as long as I'm over in Puerto Rico doing whatever I do? Yeah, I don't, I don't see that uh, being an issue. Uh, but at the same time, like if you're doing that, you just had to kind of document and convert your you know, primary residence into sure. like a business property and make sure it has a different EIN. Uh, and then make sure you have, you know, renters coming in because you could, because some people, they try to keep their primary residence mm -hmm. um, just, just parked in the U.S. Uh, and, and they think that, okay, that's their, you know, rental or business property, but they never they make never any rent rental income. So in that case, that, that's what I'm saying. It's, it all yeah. comes down to facts and circumstances. If your true intention is to use it as a rental property and, you know, investment or business property, and if you're making money, yeah, sure. I mean, in that case, yeah, that used to be your primary residence, but now it is clearly a business and investment property. Yes. So this is not investment advice. This is not for tax purposes. Uh, this is just for educational or entertainment purposes only. But I will say this, in my personal opinion, so people on, on my channel, you guys know that I travel a lot of places, uh, really between uh, my home in Houston and my home here in El Paso, Texas for business reasons. Now, when I'm traveling, the home over in actually Cyprus, we put that on Airbnb. I never understood why, if, if you're not in your home for an extended period of time, and this is everybody's preference. Some people are like, I don't want people in my house. I don't really like that. But if you have an asset that is not being used, why wouldn't you just use that asset and then rent it out? So like for this, this prime example, if we ever go to Puerto Rico, you can best be sure that we're still going to keep on with the Airbnb and just rent them out. Now, there's a lot of I mean, I can give a, a pretty good session as far as Airbnb, and I might do that, but I just don't see why people wouldn't do that uh, moving down the road. And I always thought about this when the marketing crash happened in, uh, in 2008, 2009. I, I never understood why, well, Airbnb wasn't around, but now that it is, if you're having financial issues, if I was having financial issues, excuse me, I would definitely be doing some kind of rental service to uh, in, make some kind of income and stop my house from being a uh, liability and turn it into an asset. That's just the way I always think about things. All right, so on top of that, there is one more, which is this one really confused me. You must not have closer connections to any place other than Puerto Rico. So what are we talking about? Is that like, I'm gonna leave my wife in Texas and move to Puerto Rico and that's it? Uh, I can't do that, correct? Yeah, that, that's right. Again, that, that because if, if your you know, married wife is, is in, a, in another state, that kind of creates like a closer connection to the U.S. Uh, or another situation where you would have a closer connection to the U.S. is if, if you have your bank accounts, U.S. bank accounts still open in the U.S. Uh, and you want to be a Puerto Rico resident. I mean, it just, just doesn't make any sense. And, <laughs> and, and, and also your mails are still going to your, your U.S. address or you still have gym memberships open in your you know, local county. Um, you know, think, things, things like that. Gotcha. Well, that would make sense. I guess the only way that it, it would make sense is, again, back to the houses, if you have your utility bills coming in, of course, you'd still have utility bills because you are renting out your property and that would suffice and everything else. Okay, so closer connections. I was like, well, hold on, I got a lot of family in Vegas and uh, some in California. So what happens here? Okay, now I get it. So it's all about wives and husbands or whatever else. Unless... You who are watching the video is like, hey, I want to I wanna leave my husband anyhow, so whatever. That's up to you. Okay, so that, I understand that. So let's talk about these time-based factors. And this was the one that was the most concerning, and I think the one that would be the trickiest if you really want to go this route. So we went through establishing being in Puerto Rico, and everything's good there. But if you move to Puerto Rico with appreciated crypto assets, uh, those pre-moved gains are still subject to U.S. taxes. Only the gains related to crypto purchase as a Puerto Rico resident are eligible for the 0% tax rate until January 1st, 2036. And here's a, and here was a great example. And I thought you were talking to me, except for the amount of Bitcoin. It says, say you purchased 100 Bitcoin in 2013 for a grand when you were living in Texas. I'm like, hey, I live in Texas. But <clears throat> if you did that, if you purchase any cryptocurrency beforehand, 
And then let's say tomorrow you go to Texas to establish residency. So you have to be there for six months anyhow. Everything that you purchased beforehand would still be taxed. Is that how I'm, I'm interpreting this correctly? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's right. Um, because that appreciation of those coins happened while you were a U.S. resident. So that appreciation is, is not immune from U.S. taxes, unfortunately. That's a bummer. But there was a little way to get around that, that you were talking about. Yeah, so the way to get around in, in that case is that... Um, legal, again, the, sorry. Legal. Yeah, the legal, yes. Uh -huh. so, the, so the rule is that um, you're subject to 0% capital gain taxes for whatever the investments uh, in property and stocks that you purchase as a Puerto Rican resident. Mm -hmm. So in the situation that we described, what you could do is you could sell your uh, crypto positions in the appreciated position and buy back right after that as a Puerto Rico resident uh, and kind of start like a new Puerto Rico holding period. Uh, and then from that point onwards, your taxes are subject to 0% until, until 2036 um, uh, because they have a special act. Gotcha. But the downside here is that when you kind of you know, restart that holding period as a Puerto Rico resident, you create a disposition event for U.S. tax purposes, and that gain is you, you had to pay you know hefty amount of taxes on that uh, from the U.S. side. Yeah, so there's 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 not too many things that we can do about that, right? So just to make sure, so in 2013, I buy 100 Bitcoin. I'm now a multimillionaire, and I say, well, I'm just going to go to Puerto Rico, and then I'll just stay there for six months, and then I'll cash out. You can't do that. Everything in 2013. So here's because you, you haven't moved there yet. So here's my here's my next question. The time that you get there to Puerto Rico, day zero. Let's say that you go there and you say, I sell everything right now on day zero, which would be January 23rd, okay? And then you wait six months, or no, sorry, day zero, you sell everything, you buy everything back. At six months, is that when everything, when, when you can say, okay, I, I bought this here when I was a Puerto Rico as a resident, or is it only at, at the six month point when you establish residency that you can buy and sell everything again? Yeah, uh, good question. I mean, there again, there's the, the blog post that I wrote. It's like very, very simple. I guess I didn't want to yeah. overcomplicate things. Yeah. Um, but in 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 real lives, the way it works is, you know, you you go to Puerto Rico, uh, and then you you need to buy property there. I mean, you need to buy something that you can live on. Sure. And you have to uh, file a certain application with the Puerto Rico tax, tax authority. Uh, asking uh, for the protection under this, you know, new act, so you're eligible for the zero percent tax rate. And I mean, I, again, I don't know how long they take to accept that application, mm -hmm. uh, but you need to be accepted under that program. Um, and then once you get accepted to that, uh, again, I don't know the specifics because most of this stuff is written in in a, in, a, in, in in Spanish. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, there's a possibility that you could apply that, uh, you know, Puerto Rico residency, like kind of like retroactively. Um, okay. Or like at, after you get uh, you know uh, accepted with the application, um, gotcha. yeah. Again, it, there's a lot of. I mean, then there's exceptions to that rule. I mean, you cannot apply for that if you have been in Puerto Rico for the past three years. Mm -hmm. uh, again, the point that I was trying to make from the blog was that you just cannot go there and cash out and expect zero taxes. <laughs> there's so many uh, hurdles that you have to jump. Yeah, you, you know what? You know what's funny is like I laugh. Uh, I'm like ah. It's but in, in reality, even I beforehand, when I was thinking about it, I'm like, that's all I got to do. I seriously, I was like, well, let's go to, I'll just go to Puerto Rico. I'll establish residency and I'll cash out. And that's it. Without your article and us talking about this today, I would never have known all the different stipulations. So this is good that you're here. So we, I, I appreciate it. I'm sure a lot of people are going to appreciate it. Now, here's, here's a very, it's not a nuanced question, but it's going into one more level deeper, Sheehan. I'm sorry to ask, ask these questions, but let's just say for the sake of argument that I wanna start a business over in Puerto Rico and I wanna incorporate over there. Let's say an LLC, an S Corp or a C Corp. And let's say that that business, whatever that business is, is I want to use that business to start either to transition cryptocurrency into that LLC, S Corp or C Corp, or to start buying uh, cryptocurrency in that certain way. If I could do that 
and I could be over there, would the same rules apply to me as far as like 0%? Because now we're talking about a business, an LLC, S Corp, C Corp, or even a holding company. Could I do something like that? And would there be a little bit of a different leeway on that? Yeah, I mean, uh, so the business area is covered by a different act, which okay. I'm not super familiar about. Yeah. Uh, but I do know that if you have a Puerto Rico business, like uh, I think their tax rate is like 4% or something like that. And uh, some of those certain types of gains are completely excluded from taxes. Yes. Uh, now we're but, talking. <laughs> <laughs> but again, I, I have to I had to look into to that act because That's okay. uh, and then that act was actually uh, um, updated actually late 2019. Um so it's a completely different you know, set of requirements that you need to meet versus your individual uh, tax stuff. Yeah, so I was talking to uh, a friend of mine, Miguel, and he's from Puerto Rico. And we we're talking about, hey, we might go visit over there. And we're just talking about these different things like we're talking about. And he says, you know what happened over there? And he was telling me the history of what happened. There was uh, embezzlement by people in the government. How crazy is that? Embezzlement in the government, that's crazy. And uh, they embezzled so much money. Uh, they, were getting, they were getting money from the U.S. to help with different uh, aspects. And people in, in higher positions of government were embezzling, and they took all this money, a ton of it. And, what, and then once it was all shaken out, uh, they lost a ton of money. And he says, then what happened was they went to the, uh, the people and said, we're going to have to tax a lot more to recover these types of losses. And I go, what, this happened like 50 years ago? He's like, no, it's like just happened. Like, then like, like the last five, seven years or something like that. And he's like, so what they did was they said, we need people to come to Puerto Rico. And how they did that was they started to lower taxes for businesses. This is, this is the story that I got. I didn't really, I honestly didn't research it that much. Miguel lived there, so I'm like, okay. So I think to myself, it's the same thing that like the nomad capitalist talks about. Go to where you're treated best. And if, if there is a, a province or a territory that's like, hey, we want businesses to come here because we could really use, uh, first of all, uh, job creation. Second of all, you know, lower taxes, we can do it. Why not? Everybody's a win. It's a win-win situation, I think. But that was just what I gathered from that conversation. Yeah, I mean, those are the other things that you need to consider before completely moving out of U.S., right? Because there's uh, economic uncertainty in Puerto Rico. You got to figure out, I mean, if, if that culture is that way, you want to raise your you know, family and children. Um, and there's a language barrier. Um, so those are the other factors that you need to consider you know, before moving. I think my advice for anybody in the U.S. is that I think one easy thing that you can do is just First, moving to a state with no income taxes. That's pretty easy to do. Yes. Um, Texas, um, you know, Texas, Florida. Yeah, Texas. I mean, I'm, I mean, we may be biased because we are both from Texas. <laughs> yeah. um, Texas is great. Um, and then Florida is another up and coming, you know, hot market. Uh, just just go there. Then in, as soon as you go there and cash it out, you know, after you establish a residency in a state, which is pretty easy to do, you just apply for a license, you know, sign up for, you know, rental agreement or you buy a property, you establish the residency, you cash out. Instantly, you don't have to pay 10 to 15 percent state income taxes that, that you would have been subject to if you were in a state like, you know, California or New York. Um, so I would start from there, you know, before just jumping totally out of the country and to go to like a totally foreign country. <laughs> I mean, not a country, a territory, because it's not technically a country. Yeah, yeah it, is, it, it is attached to America. You can't vote over there, but it is a territory. So it is, is attached to us. That's great. So fantastic. Okay. So Shian, that takes care of that. Let's move into the uh, Q&A section. And then we'll get to uh, Janet Yellen and uh, unrealized tax gains, which is, which is insane. But you had a good response to it. So let me share my screen yet again. And let's get to some of these questions. It might be a little bit small. Uh, I apologize, but I'll maybe blow those up. So, okay. So here's one from Nirbik Modi. He says, how do you track FIFO, uh, first in, first out, or last in, last in, first out, LIFO, while selling Bitcoin or any other crypto? Are they taxed differently, assuming you are selling under a year? I think what he's talking about here is once you buy Bitcoin, let's say you buy 10 Bitcoin, and you bought one in January, February, March, April, May, June. But let's say that you sell one Bitcoin. Which one do you take? To me, I would just say, well, it's this one, especially if I want to pay long-term uh, uh, capital gains. Is, is that? Yeah. Uh, so the, uh, the answer for this question depends on what accounting method that you're using. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, 
if you're using any type of crypto tax software or you can have all your records in like Excel spreadsheet or something like that. And if you can specifically identify each coin, each lot of coins, meaning you need to have the dates purchase, the unique identifier, the name of the crypto, um, and then how much you paid for it and stuff like that. When it comes to taxes, you can literally pick and choose which coins that you're selling. That's because you have all the information to prove that you're specifically identified identifying the units. Uh, again, if you're using a crypto tax software, that's pretty easy. It's just, it's just a click of a button uh, that whatever the software should give you the accurate uh, gain and loss report based on the specific ID. Now, if you don't have all that information, IRS wants you to default to FIFO, first in, first stop. So what that means is you cannot pick and choose whatever you whatever the coins that you want you're selling. Uh, you, whenever you make a, a sale, you're always selling the coins which you purchased the earliest. Uh, and that could be sometimes advantageous or sometimes it could be disadvantageous, but in, in many cases it is bad because the coins, in the case of Bitcoin, the coins that you purchase the earliest uh, have the lowest cost basis. So whenever you sell them, they will have the highest amount of gains that leads to the highest amount of tax bill. Right, exactly. So perfect. So having said that, I will just tell you this, which is if you're looking for a crypto software, I have my own uh, that I like to talk about, CryptoTrader.tax. Sheehan also has one that he likes to talk about himself, but CryptoTrader.tax is the one I used for two years and you can do those types of things in CryptoTrader. Now, Sheehan, you're over there at Cointracker, right? Yeah, that's correct. There's a there's bunch of tech software, uh, there's CryptoTrader, Check out Coin Tracker. Uh, just pick uh, whatever you like. <laughs> <laughs> just pick whatever you like. That's exactly yeah. it. So, so let, let's move on. So, Supernova says someone needed some tax advice. Uh, no, that's not that's not a question. <laughs> oh, if I cash out crypto that's held under the year and then use the proceeds to buy more crypto, do I have to pay short term capital gains? Yes, uh, because you you cashed out, or in other words, disposed coins, which you have for less than 12 months. So that's subject to short-term capital gains tax. Yeah. So that, so that, that was my question. Like if I could take the capital gains that I have and roll it into another business, like buying property or buying land or something like that, I can't do that either. It sounds like. You, you cannot do that either because a taxable event occurs at the time you dispose it. And uh, there's no way to kind of, you know, uh, I mean, what you could do is you could contribute crypto like property to like an LLC or like a partnership and get earn, uh, you know, ownership interest uh, based on the, the market value. So that way you're kind of, uh, you know, you don't have to pay taxes, but at the same time inside the business, you need to cash out to pay your employees and do whatever you need to do. Uh, gotcha. So yeah. this would lead me to my next point. These types of things that we're talking about a little bit more advanced, if you are looking to have somebody look at everything that you have coming in, coming out, and some alternatives, definitely take a look at this URL. This is a, a tiny URL, which will lead you to Sheehan's website. And he just has a questionnaire for you. You can fill it out and he can help you out with your taxes. Of course, uh, there is a fee for all these things, but in my opinion, it's a little bit uh, more important to spend a little bit and save a ton than not do anything and then have uh, Mr. IRS man come knocking at your door like they did to me in 2015 when I went through an audit, just saying. So I will link that in the description below. Uh, I keep getting questions about, hey, Rob, do you have a CPA? Do you have a CPA? Yeah, his name's Sheehan. And I've, been, I've done this like probably 20 times this week and it's only Friday. So I will link this in the description below for anybody who needs that. And let's see here, any other questions? Oh, the last one uh, here, it talks about the same type of thing. Uh, how does it work if in 2019, I bought $200 ether, and then $200 and then bought back 400 bucks ether at 318 in September. If I cash out my initial 400, do I pay long-term capital gains? And again, anything after a year, right, Sheehan? Yeah, anything after a year would be long-term capital gains. But in your case, in order for you to, to uh, apply that, because, because remember, you have like one layer for long-term capital gains and another layer of ether for short-term capital gains. So when you sell something and if you want to tell the IRS that you're selling the long-term lot, 
-hmm. you have to meet those specific identification requirements. That means, you know, you need to either use a crypto tax software or you need to have like all the records in case IRS asks uh, you in the future. Yeah, and I will highly recommend everybody use that software. Like I said, from the time that I opened it up, figured out what I was doing and sent it to my CPA, it was 30 minutes because they just do a direct integration into all the different exchanges. And all these different wacky exchanges that I used back in 2017, uh, they were able to, uh, to connect to. So I, I, if time is money, that saved me a boatload of money. All right, so there's that part for the Q and A's. Let's move on to our last piece, which is, all right, so look out for that second video where we're gonna take a look at uh, Janet Yellen and what she talked about as far as uh, unrealized capital gains taxes. And that's actually been going on uh, for decades now. And I will uh, put that out as soon as possible. So thanks for watching all the way to the end. I really appreciate it. And we'll see you on the next one.